Proximal hamstring tendinopathy. It's a real pain in the butt. In this episode, we'll discuss the diagnosis and treatment strategies for proximal hamstring tendinopathy. First, let's review a little bit of the anatomy of the hamstrings. So there's three different hamstring muscles. We have the biceps femoris, which is on the outside portion on the back side of the leg. And then on the inside portion of the back side of the leg, we have the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus. But when we actually look at how they attach onto the pelvis, that orientation actually flips just a little bit. So if we look at the actual anatomy, we can see that this is the femur and this is the ischial tuberosity, which is where those hamstring muscles attach onto the pelvis. And then these two bands are going to represent the hamstring muscles. We have our semimembranosus muscle, and then we have the semitendinosus and biceps femoris. And as you can see, they actually, these two muscles will actually converge onto the same tendon and they actually insert on the inside portion of that ischial tuberosity. So if there's typically tenderness on the inside portion, it's the combination of those two muscles forming the tendon, whereas the semimembranosus, which is actually on that inside portion of the back side of the leg, it actually attaches to the outside portion of the ischial tuberosity. So if we have tenderness on the outside portion of that ischial tuberosity, that's more likely to be the semimembranosus tendon. Typically when we're talking about the pathology of tendinopathy, we attribute it to overloading. And so it generally what happens with tendinopathy is that we've placed too much load, whether that's too much load in terms of intensity, duration, or frequency, and it's overloaded what the tendon can tolerate, and that's led to pain. However, the anatomy of the hamstring's insertion onto the pelvis has quite a bit of a role with proximal hamstring tendinopathy. And the reason this is, is because if we look here, Tendons don't like compression, or they don't do well with compression. And so the way that these hamstring tendons insert onto the ischial tuberosity is that as we flex, it'll actually compress the tendon against the bone, which has been shown to have a similar effect as overloading. And so when we talk about proximal hamstring tendinopathy, compression might be a big contributing factor. So that would be with uh, movements such as a deep squat, a lunge, or a deadlift, or if we're just stretching our hamstrings. Also, if we're doing a lot of sprinting or uh, uphill running, that can all cause compression on the hamstring against the ischial tuberosity, which can lead to proximal hamstring tendinopathy. The rehabilitation of proximal hamstring tendinopathy generally occurs in three different stages. We have the isometric loading stage, the concentric eccentric loading stage, and then the plyometric loading stage. Initially with isometric loading, we'll want to start by minimizing the amount of hip flexion as that will help avoid compressing the tendons against the bone. And so generally the exercise that I start with is a long lever bridge as that will allow us to keep the hip in relative neutral while still loading the hamstring muscles. And so to do this, we'll lay on our back with our heels out as far away as possible. The further out your heels are, the harder the exercise is going to be. And then you're going to lift your heels up and we're going to hold that position for somewhere to 30 to 45 seconds. Ebony Rio demonstrated that these heavy isometric exercises for the patellar tendon actually resulted in a pain relieving effect. However, this pain relieving effect hasn't been shown in other tendons, such as the Achilles tendon or the hamstring tendon. And so if we do these long lever isometric holds and they produce a pain relieving effect for proximal hamstring tendinopathy, then that's an additional benefit. But we can still use these isometric exercises as a starting place to place load on the hamstring tendon. And especially because the long lever bridge will minimize the hip flexion so we won't have that compression against the bone. After the isometric loading stage, then we can progress to concentric and eccentric muscle loading for the hamstring tendon. While the focus has generally been on eccentric loading for tendon problems, it doesn't appear that we actually need to isolate the eccentric muscle contraction, and that is based on a systematic review by Peter Malaris, which found that there was no benefit in isolating just the eccentric muscle contraction. And so for simplicity purposes, we could do a concentric and an eccentric muscle contraction, and we'll get the same outcome. And so where we can start is we can actually do a straight leg bridge. And so it's actually a progression of the long lever bridge that we did for the isometric phase. But what we'll do is we'll have our feet up on a chair or a bench. And with our knees relatively straight, we're going to lift our hips up off the ground. And that'll help engage more hip extension versus just knee flexion. 
And so in the beginning, we'll do this over three to four second muscle contraction. So three to four seconds up and then three to four seconds down. And then we can increase the speed as we progress through the rehab program. We can also progress to other concentric and eccentric muscle contractions for the hamstring tendon, specifically for hip extension, which is the proximal portion of the hamstring. So we can either do a couple different variations of a deadlift, going from a double leg deadlift to a single leg deadlift to a single leg deadlift with a pull, so using an exercise band. We can also do a diver, which was part of the L protocol for uh, hamstring strains. All of these exercises will stress the proximal portion of the hamstring, which is what we want to do to increase the tissue's resilience to load. From a technique perspective, it's important that while we're doing all these exercises that we keep a neutral pelvis. And the reason is because if we let that pelvis tip forward, it'll actually pull the hamstring against that ischial tuberosity, which can lead to further irritation. So whether we're doing the diver exercise or a deadlift variation, we want to make sure that we're keeping our core engaged so we're keeping that pelvis level throughout all the movements. The final stage of a rehab program is plyometric exercises. And in the plyometric exercise phase, that's where we're gonna expose the tendon to quick loads, which is gonna most similarly replicate what it's gonna be exposed to when we return to sport. And so a couple different exercises that we can do in this phase are we could do skipping variations, we could do a squat jump, or we can do a jumping lunge. All of those are gonna place a quick load on the hamstring tendon. Because plyometric exercises place a high amount of load on the tendon, it's important that we allow adequate recovery after we do a plyometric exercise session. And so generally for tendons, they take somewhere between 48 to 72 hours to respond after a plyometric exercise. And so we wanna make sure that when we're programming our rehab program or a performance program for that matter, we leave two to three days in between those sessions so that the tendon can adapt and we don't continually overload it. During those relative rest days, we can go back to just the strengthening exercises. So we can either deadlift or do hamstring curls or something like that where we're still stressing the hamstrings. We're just not doing plyometric load on those hamstring tendons. Another biomechanical consideration for those returning to sport after a proximal hamstring tendinopathy is that we need to look at their gait cycle, specifically when they're running. The reason is because with those with proximal hamstring tendon issues, there's actually a reduced glute activation. And so when they're running, they're not getting as much hip extension from the glutes. And so that force is being generated by the hamstrings instead, which can contribute to the overloading of a hamstring. Overstriding is another important thing to look at with the gait cycle. And the reason is because of that decreased glute activation, so they're not producing as much force into hip extension, they turn running from a push movement to a pull movement. And so they extend that leg forward a little bit further and the hamstring works to actually pull the body forward versus the glute pushing the body forward. And so again, that'll lead to more compression for one against the ischial tuberosity because there's gonna be a little bit more hip flexion, but also it's gonna to contribute to that overloading of the hamstring tendon. So when we're looking at rehab, we can specifically target the hamstring muscles for strength, but we also need to look at some of the biomechanics as well. Thank you for watching this episode on proximal hamstring tendinopathy. I hope that you found this information useful. If you did, go ahead and give this video a big thumbs up. If you want to see more of my content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. And if you want to be notified of future videos, hit the bell icon as well. I'll see you guys in the next video.